Hi, it's Juliana. Before we get to our episode about language, we want to let K-Pod listeners know that we would love your input for our next episode, which is about hanbang, traditional Korean medicine, which includes acupuncture, cupping, and herbs. If you have a question about traditional Korean medicine, whether it's about certain ailments, remedies you remember from childhood, or its place in Korean culture, we'd love to feature it on the episode and hopefully have our hanbang expert answer it. You can email your questions to kpod at koreanamericanstory.org or DM us on Instagram at koreanamericanstory. Even better, email us a voice note with your name and your question. And now, here's our episode. Hi, and welcome to K-Pod, the podcast about Korean Americans and arts and culture from Korean American Story. I'm Katherine Hong, a writer and editor. And I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. Today, we are in Princeton, New Jersey, at the home of Youngmi Yucho, who is a professor of Korean language and culture at Rutgers University. As we've mentioned before, Juliana and I are doing a special series of K-Pod this season, where we're interviewing experts on cultural topics. Korean language was at the very top of our list. So thank you, Professor Youngmi Yu Cho, for having us today. Youngmi Yu Cho is an expert on Korean language, linguistics, and Korean studies, and has been extremely influential in shaping the way Korean is taught in the United States. She received a BA in English from Seoul National University and came to the States as a graduate student in linguistics at Stanford in the 1980s. That's where she earned her PhD and also where she started teaching classes in Korean language. Professor Cho is co-author of the textbook series Integrated Korean, which is used in more than 70 universities worldwide, and Integrated Korean Accelerated, a textbook for Korean heritage learners. We're so delighted to be finally interviewing you. Thank you for having us, Professor Youngmi Yu Cho, who I think we will call Youngmi during this interview. Forgive us the <laughs> over uh, familiar familiarity. familiarity. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we are creating a third space. <laughs> so... We thought we could just start by asking you about your path to becoming a linguist. You were born in Seoul, is that right, or Korea? Actually, I was born in Cheongju, which is a central uh, city uh, with colleges, and my father was a professor there. And in uh, mid-1960s, like a lot of people, our family moved to Seoul, mainly motivated by my parents, especially my mom's desire for education. My mother had like a plans ahead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my sister will go to Ihua Girls High School and I'll go to Gyeonggi Girls High School. So when we are very young, she had this all planned. And then the best way of doing that is going to Seoul. <laughs> and what year did you graduate a university? Uh, 1979. So how did you choose your field? Ah, good question. All through uh, school, I was very good at language. Language and history and all that. So in Korea, in high school, you have to decide if you are a humanities person or you are a science person. So I went to humanities and then, you know, you're allowed to take all, all sorts of different uh, courses as opposed to if I went to one department, then it would be very prescribed. And then by the time we had to choose in the, I think after three semesters, I chose English literature. And I love literature. I love reading. And then with the English literature, you also learn uh, like a history of language. And so I know that I'm interested in language. I'm interested in, so with that background, I got interested in Korean linguistics as well. You know, we study Korean linguistics and grammar as part of the college entrance, which is really extremely boring. You had to memorize all this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, parts of speech and whatnot. And so I didn't think I would be interested in linguistics, but learning, you know, in a different framework, I began to see, oh, well, having a ling English linguistics is no different to, of studying Korean linguistics. There's this universal themes or things, the cognitive aspects that all linguists should study. And overall, my experience was quite good. Well, it was a very sexist society then. We had, I think, entire faculty of our humanities probably had two women faculties out of hundreds. And, but then, even so, we were not discouraged that that you will never amount to anything. So what it was was that if you go to the, to the States and study and get PhD, then you can come back and teach. 
So that thing was available to, uh, to my uh, great surprise. Uh, it was because it was an English department. If I majored in Korean uh, history or Korean uh, language or literature, I don't think that that door was there. And then I came to States, and the first day of school, I couldn't understand half of what the professors were saying. So I was in total despair. I couldn't understand the spoken word. So when you came to study in the States, were you still uh, a master's student in English or linguistics? Uh, so I was in the master's program, but then, you know, many uh, universities, especially Stanford, there is no separate, uh, there, some students do master's, but it is like you have to jump into uh, PhD. While I was deciding on that, I took a course called uh, Linguistics for Literature Person, Literature Majors or something. And that was eye-opening. And I knew that, oh, I love literature. I love reading books, but I'm not necessarily interested in doing literature analysis. I find it too confining. This is the perfect course for you. And my sort of exposure to linguistics was very philological. That is, this is the history of these words. This is, so there seems to be no kind of system there. But the linguistics uh, back then in the 80s was very Chomskyan. It's like there is a principle, there's a parameters, and you can develop any language from that universal grammar. Of course, these days there are criticism and whatnot, but that was so revelatory to me. I said, oh, this is perfect for me because I knew that I have some inkling of a scientist in me, which was not able to be satisfied by doing literature or by doing old-fashioned linguistics. Mm -hmm. So that was really perfect. So I said, oh, now I know that I don't want to do literature. I want to do linguistics. So I didn't come to America to be a Korean teacher. Okay. I came here maybe to study English linguistics. And then uh, maybe my goal then was to finish quickly and go home and be a professor mm -hmm. there. Of what, maybe? Of whatever, you know, linguistics or English, uh, English uh, linguistics, that area. So it was very clear, you know, because... I'm not very good at many things. So when people think about my career, your career, I mean, you can be a photographer, but I can never be. <laughs> so when I was growing up, I said, oh, I cannot be anybody else but teacher. I cannot be anybody else but a researcher. In an interview that we watched of you, you said that you are more interested in how to incorporate culture into the language uh, courses mm -hmm. because language is the receptacle of culture. Mm -hmm. Did I say that? You did say that. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, you know, I really latched on to that and mm. I wrote it down mm. because that's um, something that we really think about a mm. lot mm -hmm. and how I've heard that this is now not true, but that there are so many different words for snow in countries yes, where yes. Mm. Um, there's a lot of snow. But uh, what, when we spoke with like Catherine's mom and uh, Francis. Francis Cha, the novelist. They pointed out that maybe there are more words for sorrow and longing, possibly in the Korean language. <laughs> we'll share with you this list. You can look at it briefly. You yeah. can read it out. Mm -hmm. These were some words that Francis, mm -hmm. I asked her about words that don't exist in English. Mm -hmm. And the ones that sprung to mind for mm -hmm. her were all these sort of melancholy words. And my mom also agreed that those are the yeah. words that she wishes that existed in English. Mm -hmm. And especially since the word Han is getting so much mm -hmm. publicity mm -hmm. in the yeah, American we'd love press. What, actually, if you could just read out the list, I think people might like to just hear the words and tell us what you think. Arionada. Do you want the definition too? Hazy, non-distinctive. And ashiwa. This is one thing that I have trouble with, like translating with my students. Mm -hmm. Give us your quick definitions for Ashiwa. all of these, I guess. Ashiwa, uh, it says, feeling like something is very missing. Uh, many times, as a, like a casual conversation, it's a, what a shame. But then it, that doesn't really convey the like, Ashiwa. Uh, uh, it's like, I wish I could do this for you, but it, so the circumstance doesn't allow it. And kichanta, bothersome, oh, well, <laughs> medium. <laughs> and bushi, uh, sorokta, sad, and kripta, yeah. Okay, so I, I probably, this is probably from a novelist view, 
of things and Han and Chong, everybody knows mm -hmm. affection, right? Han, mm -hmm. Han as, I mean, there's a psychological definition of that, which I don't want to repeat, has had a, a big mileage out of uh, sort of explaining Korean culture for the past, I don't know, 50 years or so. So anthropologists studied it. And I think it's part of Korean lexicon, part of Korean thing, but not necessarily has a deep tradition. Mm. You know, when you approach a culture, you approach from contemporary view. Mm -hmm. So yes, the late 19th century, the colonialism and the division and the Korean War, all these things, separated families, is the fertile ground to talk about Han. And also, you know, the, how the women, women were treated during the Joseon dynasty, not so much in Shilla or Korea mm -hmm. dynasty, but Joseon dynasty was, can be a room for Han. However, I find Han and Jung very confining in defining Korean. So I can give maybe a longer list of Korean words that doesn't have the sad mm, yeah. connotation. Well, well, their flavors. My mom was telling me about mm. tastes. Yes. Certain tastes like. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I can say a lot of things about. Uh, uh, Which have nothing to do with sadness. It's just it's yes. a certain kind and of so taste. And so you sent me the uh, list of possible questions, right? Yeah. One thing that I some? wanted to ask people, my son and friends, was what are Korean words that's hard to translate? You know, I teach Korean translation. Uh, multimedia translation and literary translation and also practical translation. And so we encounter a lot of words that we find, oh, we never thought twice about it mm -hmm. because it's so natural, mm -hmm. but how mm -hmm. do we translate that? And so thing that came up immediately was food taste, to kind of taste oh, words. Yes. And my son's favorite is, as a child, he really didn't like soggy stuff. So taku or noodles, it has to be el dente. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when you know ramen or some noodles were prepared, he said, "It's pajad. <laughs> it's using pajida uh, with a what, English what is pajida? Uh Pajida will be soggy, but mm. it's more than soggy. It's like you know, suddenly very uninteresting. Mm. So that's his word, and also he had the other word was it's sort of corresponding. He said, "Jolgi jolgi tada." He said things should be jolgi jolgi tada, not just noodles, but everything. What does like that a mean? Kogi. Jolgi jolgi tada, chewy. Yeah. But if you say chewy, it, the whole thing mm -hmm. goes. Like the texture is there is a, um, a springiness. A, a, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But then depending on the material, it's different. Mm -hmm. So kuksu ga jolgi jolgi tada will be different from kogi ga jolgi jolgi tada. Yes, yes. So he said, you know, this is untranslatable. So he gave me a couple of <laughs> food words, and. Yeah, I mean, these days, if you go to YouTube, people say, "Egyo cannot be translated. It's like a female cuteness <laughs> or 내 숨을 떨다. 내 숨을 떨다 will be, uh, you pretend that nothing is the case where you don't share mm -hmm. your inner thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a whole list of things. And oftentimes students come up with Chong and Han, and I said, yeah, you can do it, but only so much. Mm -hmm. Because they tend to, you know, bag everything into that, uh, fray. Do you think that there is any kind of running thread in the words that are um, hard to translate from Korean to English? Yes, yeah, a, yeah. There is. Okay, so actually there is a reason why it is the case. Korean and Japanese are big on sound symbolism called onomatopoeia. Mm -hmm. And English, of course, we have onomatopoeia, bang, or mm -hmm. thump, or Vroom. twinkle, twinkle, yeah. little stars. But only occasionally. And also you don't have the sound uh, associated with the meaning. Probably the only thing that I can come up with is GL, gleam, glitter, uh, then you have uh, some kind of light, right? And also SW, like a swall, sway, maybe mm -hmm. large, like a smooth action. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you really have to crack your brain to find something. But in Korean, there are thousands of words systematically related to connote meaning, but this can be sound imitating. Also, it can be manner imitating, or it can be psychological state. So what are some sounds? Sounds, examples? you can say, uh, there is no, uh, it means dark. There is uh, no news from somebody. It's kind of darkish. But if you say, that's going to be darker. 
And if you say, come, come, Ada, it's going to be dark, but in a spooky way. Hmm. So that I'm noticing double sounds. Yeah, double sounds tends mm-hmm. like intensity. Okay. So consonants does that. So it's systematic. It's not just one word. It's the whole thing. And then uh, vowels do that too. So the words that hard to uh, translate is kosohada. Uh, mm-hmm. How would you translate kosohada? Savory? Yeah, so I do it savory, but it's, it's a late, it's a late <laughs> translation. <laughs> the typical kosada will be the kesogum, the uh, sesame, uh, sesame oil, right? Mm-hmm. But then there's kusuhada. The vowel is different. Mm-hmm. And what's that? Kusuhada is in a cute way, and kusuhada will be, yeah, savory, but uh, in a more blend, but still. Uh, so, uh, do you know nurungji? When you have a a rice and then burnt part Mm -hmm. and then you will boil it right Mm -hmm. and then when you have it there it's not strong but it's very fragrant in a different way in a very you cannot really it's not savory because it's just plain Mm -hmm. rice but because of the burnt thing yeah there's a that's my favorite there's a flavor there (laughs) and also kusada can be somebody's accent somebody's you know chungcheongdo accent is kind of kusuhada it's not like very choppy or very uh fast like uh, Seoul speech, but can be like sl- a little slow and very, like has a local flavor, then mm-hmm. we can say, oh, his speech is kusuhada. I've actually done a paper on this. There are at least 7,000 all these pairs, consonants and vowels. And this is used a lot in poetry and in mm. rap. Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. listen to, you mm-hmm. know, uh, a BTS, I actually do a little study and uh, exercise in, in class. So students look at all the uh, lyrics and then we identify this uh, sound symbolic words or manner imitating words and then analyze it. In English translation, nothing happens. So, uh, toki ga kang chung kang chung, you should say, uh, the rabbit jumps. Yeah. Well, but yeah. kang chung kang chung is different from kong chung kong chung. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, also, Advertisement uses that a lot because you don't need to say a lot. You just say one word, then we don't have to even have to say the vowel, I mean the verb. You just, with that adverb, like a twinkle, twinkle, then you know that starts uh, shining. So it's used if you listen to Korean ad or poems or children's uh, uh, songs, then there, there is, is ubiquitous. But the, unfortunately, in uh, educational setting, we don't tend to teach that. Because mm-hmm. we think of it as kind of an extra. So students have to acquire that on their own. But if you watch K-drama or, you know, this entertainment show, you see that all the time. Well, that's something we wanted to ask you about, mm. too, is like um, you've been teaching the Korean language for so many years. Yes. There must have, you must have witnessed the change in Korean language, um, at least the way it's spoken in K-dramas, mm. used in... Mm. I mean, it, we've always been told that the Korean language that our parents spoke uh, when they first left Korea and still do is so different now from the contemporary Korean that's spoken. Yes, language change. Okay, so before I uh, uh, answer that, let me talk about... Uh, so I was an accidental Korean teacher in mm-hmm. 1986 because my linguistics uh, classmates, they wanted to study Korean. And yes, I'm a native speaker of Korean, but I was not a Korean teacher. So I got a book and then sort of put together some syllabus and started to teach. This was a, the Stanford had this program, special language program, where five students request and then the the class will be offered. Mm. And so I started to teach it. And that was most learning experience because, you know, these people who had no knowledge of Korean wants to learn, I mean, Alphabet was the easiest part. Mm-hmm. And now when we go to grammar or the, uh, the sentences, it's impossible to, to kind of teach. And back then, uh, so there are some uh, textbooks, but not very good. So I got one that's called Myeongdo's Korean. It was adequate, but then it was uh, published by a uh, Catholic uh, uh, publications. So there's all, all, all about nun and then father. <laughs> And all that. So I had to do a lot of editing. Mm, mm. And also, I think this was uh, published in the 1970s. I taught it in the 80s. But 
was very sexist in the say, mm-hmm. oh, the woman is there then says, oh, what do you study? I study French and says, oh, you should, you should study home economics because you will get a better <laughs> marriage prospect. <laughs> And then there's another one says uh, husband and wife pair, and then uh, husband getting mad says, oh, why didn't you polish my shoes? I have to go out now and make sure that I, my uh, Y Shatsu gets back from the cleaner. So I had to struggle with that. And so that was my first experience. So kind of I, I was brought on as an accidental Korean teacher. And so since then I did some research, but there were no good materials. And then my learning Japanese actually gave some idea of how to teach a language very different from English. You know, 19, mid 80s was a good time to start Korean program in colleges. Let me tell you why. Uh, so Korean language uh, program started in the 1940s as part of the Cold War efforts as a national security thing. So uh, Berkeley and University of Washington and Hawaii offered courses in uh, Korean, but they were for the armed forces mm. and mainly to be able to understand, mm-hmm. you know, Japan and the Korea. Anyway, that's the beginning of the, compared to uh, Chinese studies that studied in the 19th century, mid 19th century, can you believe it? So they had a longer history, Korea did, uh, didn't. And then finally, after the Korean War, the big universities, like five of them started Korean program late 50s or 60s. So Harvard, Columbia, Indiana, and a couple of places. And in the 80s, when I was a graduate student, suddenly there was an impetus. Uh, number one, uh, 1965 Immigration Act. Mm-hmm. So Koreans came in droves, right? And their children started to come to college. And I they see. wanted to I learn see. Korean. Mm-hmm. So the, uh, the administration says, even if it's not a, really a regular course, please start one. Since I had kind of the uh, experience, I continue to teach uh, Korean. The last 20 years was a different outlook. So when I first started, probably 60, 70, 80% were Korean Americans. Now I have about 10%, 15%. Wow. Yeah. When I took Korean as an undergrad. I remember most of the students were Korean undergrads like mm-hmm. myself who didn't speak Korean as kids and yeah. wanted to learn it. Mm-hmm. But then we started seeing a trickle of graduate students yes. in law and business, mm-hmm. white people mm-hmm. um, thinking that they want to yeah. work mm-hmm. in Asia. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming now that there are many, many business students yes. studying Korean. Yeah, business. I mean, uh, I mean all, all sorts. Also, you know, it's not a monolingual English speakers. I have what we call super diversity. So students come from all kinds of backgrounds. So probably more so in the East Coast and West Coast, you know, Hindi speakers, you know, uh, Mongolian speakers, you know, Spanish speakers, mm-hmm. we have all of them. And the, the heartening uh, thing is that they already are very interested. They already know Korean in a kind of rudimentary way, but still uh, K-pop, K-drama. And so they come very motivated. But let me tell you, the first year you can have class with students who are interested in K-pop. But student, in order to have the full degree program or full uh, uh, development of proficiency, uh, K-pop is not enough. Well, interested in Taekwondo is not enough. (laughs) Having a (laughs) Korean girlfriend is not enough. (laughs) What matters is that they have to know that they're progressing. And I think that's one of your questions that, why is it so hard? (laughs) And I am sorry to tell you, it is very hard, uh, scientifically proven. uh, To to learn Korean Korean is more If you're a language speaker, Mm -hmm. yes. What is the difficulty for people? All right, so... Uh, empirically, uh, State Department did a, a long-term 45, 50-year research on how long does it take to train diplomats to send to these countries. So they came up with four different levels of language. Level one, you need about 24 weeks of class time uh, to be able to, that, that level that you can kind of function, and French, Italian, Spanish, that block. And the second group, is uh, you need maybe, uh, I don't know, 36 hours. Third group, maybe 40 hours. 
And the last group, group four, you need 88 hours. So we need like four times more time. Who is in the last group? Who are the, I mean, there are not too many uh, languages there. Uh, it's Chinese, either Mandarin or Cantonese, and Russian, and Arabic, and Korean. Mm. Mm. I had no idea. I feel better now because I didn't do very well in my class. So. <laughs> yes. Um, what, and the what same is, is true for yeah. Koreans learning English too okay. because if it's hard for you. And, but as my experience uh, tells me, uh, as a Korean speaker, learning Japanese is so easy. So in three years, I was able to do this or to read the, the books. And these poor American students, they're extremely bright students, but they were struggling. And what do you think um, are some of the reasons all through Korean history for millennium, Koreans learning uh, Chinese was difficult, but they did it. Not for speech purposes, but to study the classics. And upper class men were able to handle that. So all the Joseon Dynasty beautiful history books that I have here are all written in beautiful Chinese classical language. Mm -hmm. uh, so English and uh, Korean are very different. Uh, number one, because they are not genetically related. Number two, they are not typologically similar. So typologically similar means that even though you're not related, you may have similar features. For instance, uh, Chinese and English, you have subject first, an object, and a verb, right? You say, Mary loves John, right? And the order tells you who is the subject, who is the object, where is the verb. But in Korean, we don't do that. We do... John, Mary, John, love. It's not all. It, that's those, the simple syntax. We don't, we get rid of subject. We get rid of object. So when you say, 안녕하세요, where is you? But how do I know it's addressed to you? Because you look at honorific 세. Then your answer will be, 아, 네, 괜찮습니다, 잘 있어요. That will be, the subject will be I. We never say you or I. So the, all this what we call zero pronominals. Pronominals are not expressed, but they are not random. So if you look at that, a lot of things are missing there. So this is a discourse-oriented language. You can recover by speaking, but in, it's not written. In English, I is so redundant. I go to school, mm -hmm, I do this. Mm -hmm. So in some old-fashioned uh, journal writing, I is missing, like went to school, I met this person, right? But in Korean, you if you keep on repeating those, that's not Korean. That's really very bad. So how do you recover? There are cues. So in the AI translation, English Korean is much easier than Korean to English. Because Korean, there are many information that's not there that you have to recover from the context. Mm. Honorifics is one good way to know that ah, it's about you rather mm -hmm. than me. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting to me because I was chatting with my mom to prepare for this interview. Mm -hmm. And I realized this is why she and I are often get into these conversations where I'm so frustrated. I say, Mom, who said that? Who? <laughs> she, she's telling me a story. I'm constantly, who are you, who are you talking about? And... I always thought it was just her way of telling mm -hmm. a story. And it's definitely because in Korean, you don't have to specify who is saying what, he or she, I did I mean, this. It's I'm there. all confused it's when not, she's speaking English to me. I felt yeah. much more, <laughs> I could understand. Much more forgiving. Oh, completely, yeah. And this, the, the, as a linguist, so what kind of inspires me that none of this is random. There are rules. There, there's a reason why it is done. These are recoverable information. So in a way, it's more efficient. You know, you don't have to say every time I, right? Right. So, and uh, more recently, I had a, I published a book in Korea, and I had an interview with a, a Korean newspaper, and it was in uh, Korean, right? And my son's uh, probably Korean ability is about, you know, intermediate level. So he wanted to do Google Translate, and he thought, Mom, it says... It's the, I was talking about my mom and myself, and it says, your mom went to Seoul National, and it says, you invented the Korean alphabet in the <laughs> translation, because there's no subject. Mm -hmm. Because Korean sentences are also very long and winding. Hmm. Yeah. And you have to know which, what's the main, main clause and what's the subject of that. So many times the mistake is that they kind of cut it off and they translate that bit, without paying attention to the last mm -hmm. bit. So the verb is mm -hmm. the most important part in Korean because it has all the information. 
It has honorifics, it has past tense, it has you know, passive, whatever information is there. So you can speak only with a verb, but not with other things. And then verb endings are so complex, so there are about 150. And I feel pity for my students because in our you know, first and second year students, you said, ah, these are all you need to know. But then in real life, they go out and there are so many different endings they have to negotiate. Mm. Mm. So I do have a question about Korean names. Yes. Even though I find myself to be like an advanced beginner, probably, mm-hmm. I have a really hard time remembering Korean names. names. Yeah. The two syllable uh-huh. And um, and I remember hearing that the actor Hyunbin, mm. um, he shortened his name to two syllables because it would be much simpler mm. for people outside of Korea to remember him. Mm. And it's actually true because I can remember his Hyun name, <laughs> whereas other Korean actors uh-huh. that I, you know that I admire, uh-huh. I have a hard time remembering uh-huh. the three syllables. Uh-huh. But um, the Korean name. I think is really interesting because if you look at the AP style book, mm-hmm. North Koreans write their name differently than South Koreans. Mm-hmm. There's a hyphen in South Korean names, but there isn't for mm-hmm. North Koreans. Mm-hmm. I know Westerners have a really hard time because the last name comes first in Korean, but there are also lots of Korean names with only two syllables. Mm-hmm. And I had asked my mother about this. Why is it that most Korean names have three Mm. characters, but some Korean names only have two? Mm. And she... She said, oh, it's because some people couldn't afford the third character. <laughs> and I couldn't tell if this had something to do with cast or if it, no. she was just joking or... Yeah, actually, I have a... a uh, this is a topic that I really uh, am very interested in. And for the personal names, okay, let's talk about it. By uh, Korea Dynasty, let's say the 10th century, 11th century, uh, only royal families and aristocrats had family names. So people had probably names that also there are no family register per se. So uh, especially women's names were kind of ignored. Mm-hmm. So they would be given mm-hmm. like a flower or this or that. And then it's just, and even now women's names, are also sometimes guys' names are not called. Names are not, you are not called a person by the name many times. So that's, you know, in a way it's a taboo. Right. We should explain for people like, um, on me someone's or, mother, like like yeah, their right, role. Right. My right? mom is not. Her friends right. call her Kathy's mama or something. That's right. right. And and it's all because of the more like East Asian collective collectivism in a way because you are not you. Your individual name is not that important, and you are somebody's daughter. You are somebody's wife. Somebody, especially for women. And so one time there was this little movement by housewives that we want to have a name card with our name on it because we are never being called by my name. Uh, So I think that was kind of a reflection of that. And so typically it's three syllables because the uh, the last name, which is a surname, family name is one syllable. And then original Korean family names are very few, like Park and Kim and Seok, and are very few like a Shilla dynasty. Uh, then, you know, gradually, uh, uh, people uh, started, especially elite, started to take the name because a lot of these things came from China. They look at China, the higher civilizations, oh, this is how, how they do administration, this is how they do it, so why don't we also try it? So they got a lot of Chinese family names. They are mm. not necessarily Chinese, no. Mm-hmm. But they got those names, and then a lot of uh, times they said, I'm the first in this clan. So if you look at it, except for a few in our royal families in Shilla, a lot of clan initiator originated in uh, Korea dynasty, for instance. Um, what's, what would be the rough date for that? Korea dynasty will be uh, uh, 1910 through uh, 13, 1392. Okay. So we're talking about like 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, okay. around that time. So gradually people are conscious of Having a status meaning you have to have a family. The same is true in, the, in, in Europe, I'm sure. And so in the Joseon dynasty, things got a little bit more tight because it's a neo-Confucian society where it's more centrally uh, governed. And there, men, especially the, the Yangban men, they get their name for sure. 
And it's not any random name. They had to have followed uh, the Korean tradition. So there's your family name first, and then there's a generation name. So families differ. So in my family, it, uh, it kind of sweeps. So it's the first level or it's the last level, depending on the generation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's already given there. In my family, I remember looking at 60 names already given. It's not randomly given. It is based on five elements of Asian philosophy. So for oh. instance, my name, Young Mi, Young has this character water in it. Young is uh, eternal. Mm-hmm. And Mi is beauty. And sort of not everybody gives generation name to girls because they think girls will be married up. You're not part of our family. But starting in the early 20th century, my uh, mother's family who was a kind of young ban. They decided to give girls uh, family names too. So my mom and all her sisters have the the names, uh, the family names. Can we clarify, what do you mean by family name? Is that the last name or is that the oh, there's generation? A fami- of- I'm sorry, family name is your surname, mm-hmm. but you have generation name, yeah. all your br- uh, mm-hmm. brothers, typically brothers or paternal cousins share. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you will see, you and know, that is if a it's generational Kim Young-cha, Kim- yeah, yeah. I call it generation name. Yes. In Korean, it's Tolimcha. Tolimcha. Mm. And so they didn't give... Women. Women Tolimcha at all. Okay. Because it was not necessary. If you look at the old uh, genealogy book, women are identified as a second daughter of Mr. Kim from some mm. region. Korea is probably one of the few countries where women don't adopt the husband's name yes. when married. So it was only the elite class, but then... Toward the end of the Joseon dynasty, it spread everywhere. I see. And then it was very popular, but not so much these days. And in 1948, when Korea, South Korea had a new law of the like naming and marriage, they allowed non-Chinese names too. So they started giving name like a Korean word like tuntuni or sesa or arumi. And so oftentimes that's also two syllable. However, not always. I remember in the 80s that uh, probably 90s. Uh, there was a, a tragic incident of a little girl kidnapped, and her name was Panjak uh, Panjak Pinari, seven <laughs> syllable, which the government allowed. So, because these are all Korean That's words. That's incredible. Yeah, Panjak Panjak Twinkle Twinkle mm-hmm. and Pinari. It's a very beautiful name, but I was told that she's often called Nari mm-hmm. by the last mm-hmm. two syllable rather than that. So, but then in the, uh, I had a, a record somewhere, but in the mid. Uh, early 90s, maybe, the government says, no, this is too much. Uh, so we are going to stop giving you so much space. You know, we are very uh, stingy about computer space. So you are allowed to have only like five slots. I may be wrong. Five slots in your given name. So it's not any early. But if you uh, look at uh, people who were born in the 70s, 80s, still you see like 14 syllable names. Mm, mm. But it has meanings in it. It is. So if you we run across somebody with just two characters in their name, more than likely they're an older female, do you think? No. No? <laughs> two syllable, like a, that is single syllable given name. Mm-hmm. That has a special status. But one thing, royal families will have a single syllable name. All the Joseon dynasty kings of 26 people, they have single syllable name. Of course, you are never allowed to call them by their proper name, they would be called King Sejong instance, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, the reason is that if royal family have certain characters, nobody ever, ever is allowed to use that character as part of your name or as part of any speech. It's sacrilegious to wow. use that. So if the king has two, two syllable names, that'll be even harder for mm, commoners to. I see. So they uh, have that. And I also heard that uh, there's a ho, so E, the royal family Li, they often have a monosyllable uh, given name. Mm-hmm. And another family I know is Ho. This is the royal uh, uh, family name of Silla dynasty. And this Ho, this may be a legend, uh, is a princess uh, traveled from India and became a princess, uh, became the queen of Silla king. Mm-hmm. And her name uh, was probably something else, but it's, it's Ha. So all a lot of Ha I know, they have single family names. Mm-hmm. Sort of uh, maybe they want to keep their mm-hmm. royal uh, mm-hmm. l- line there. Mm-hmm. And but you know it's not just three syllables. Uh, some there are about I think about ten 
uh, double syllable family names like Sonu uh, or Namgong. Oh, I I'd never heard of a double syllable family name. Uh, so in that case, people can choose two syllables, so they can end up with four syllables, or they can be just Namgung Wan, who is an actor, Namgung Wan. Then people will not know whether his family name is Nam mm, or Namgung. Mm. They are kind of rare, but it's there. So you see uh, typically four syllable uh, names if their names are like that. But these days, you know, if I look at the, I also teach something about Korean naming practice. Uh, and there we, ha- we had about uh, 300 family names. Given the population, it's very small. Japanese has about 700 different mm-hmm. family names, and Chinese is even more. But even counting for the uh, population, it's really extremely small. I've always been confused by Korean spelling. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or transliteration. So mm-hmm. you can spell dakboki with a T T E O K B O K K I or D U K K B O K K I. I mean, it, and there's no consistency from on the internet, clearly. Yes. But I know that there have been. It's been sis- systematized. There, there's been systematization. Mm-hmm. But can you just give us a nutshell explanation yes. of why is Again, it so confusing like and how t- we should be spelling things well, now? I cannot teach you that, but I can tell you why it's so confusing. Because Korean consonants and vowels, we have a lot more than the English alphabet 26 will allow. So, for instance, Japanese uh, transliteration is easier because they have fewer numbers of consonants and vowels. mekin Raushawa system, which was devised in the 1930s and 40s, still a standard for scholarly publication. So Library of Congress has that, but it is clumsy because it you have to have a special symbol on top. Mm. And give us an mm. example of that kind of spelling. Uh, if you want to have a O vowel, then you have the O and a half circle on top. Mm-hmm. Mm. And for all the uh, literary, I mean, scholarly production, you see that. It's not perfect, but it worked. But it doesn't, you know, the ideal system is that whatever you see in Hangul should be represented differently, right? Uh, for instance, Chan and Chan. Those are two different family mm-hmm. names. But oftentimes, it's C-H-U-N, C-H-U-N. It's the same, mm-hmm. even though they're different. And there's a tragic story during the Korean War, the uh, 1950-some, 52. Uh, U.S. bombed a lot, uh, you know, South and North Korea. And they were, the pilot was instructed to bomb uh, Jeongju. In Korean, it will be Jeongju. But they bombed Cheongju, mm. which is my hometown. Mm. I was not born then. <laughs> but because the map should have Cheongju with a C-H-E-O-N-G maybe, and the Cheongju with a C-H with an apostrophe on top. Mm. But in that small map, apostrophe mm. is hard to see. And the mekin Russia system with apostrophe is, is, is a bother. So South and North Korea had their own system, which is not... It has its advantages and disadvantages. So, for instance, uh, Joseon Dynasty, Goryeo Dynasty, pro, uh, back in Raushao system will be CH or K. But in the Korean pronunciation, it's not really K, but it's not really J either. Right? Joseon. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's, it's not Cho, but it's not Jo either. Mm-hmm. It's in between. So, South Korea decided. Well, still, it may not match perfectly, but we don't want to have a, a less confusion. So, Joseon will be J O S E O N rather than C H O S O N. And then they will want to get rid of the, uh, uh, all the symbols because you know typing is difficult. Mm-hmm. So, vowels are really, really difficult in the South Korean system because if it's O, then it's E O. If it's uh, my, uh, I grew up in Yoido in Seoul, and Yoido will be, I don't know, I have to think how to, <laughs> Yo, Y, O, R, mm-hmm. U, I, if you have a, a little hy- a hyphen on top, uh, in a way, as a scholar, I find it easier to handle, but if you have to spell out, well, uh, you know, linearize all the vowels, you don't know where the vowel ends and then the, the, with the next syllable. So it is a, problem because of the uh, sounds of the language. So there will be no improvement. So we, you have to live with that. But the good thing is that these days, even if you do dogbook in various ways, it, it leads you mm-hmm, to the right mm-hmm, place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I can do the Korean and it leads you to the right place. 
So if you look at the Library of Congress cataloging system, many languages has one page romanization. Uh, some languages are four pages, six pages. Korean is the only language with the 60 pages. Oh my gosh. So I always insist on anybody learning Korean alphabet. If you learn Korean alphabet, it's easy. You don't have to think twice. Yeah. Uh, and once <coughs> I was asked to write dummies for Korean. So I was looking <laughs> at it. <coughs> you mean Korean for dummies? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I sort of did the first chapter and then I decided not to do it because they insist on romanization. I see. So I said, Hangul is the easiest thing. Anybody can learn it. Because when Sejong invented that, it was so easy that all the scholars there says, it's too easy, it, it has no value. Uh, and then one person said, oh, it is easy for the commoners. You can learn it if you are a decent man, you can learn it in like a half a day. Even if you are slow, and even if you are a woman, you can learn it in three days. <laughs> <laughs> or else, um, you know, I took a Korean class on 32nd Street. Mm. Um, when I was in my 20s, and the instructor said, even a monkey could learn uh, how to read Korean. <laughs> actually, that's my like a pet hobby. Anybody who goes to Korea, I uh, offer free Zoom alphabet lesson. Mm. So I said, if I give you two hours, you can master mm. anything. So back to the spelling. When you see a certain spelling, can you know which system they're using or... Yeah, yeah. Like so. Let's say back to food. Deji, I see like pork. D W A E J I. There's that, and then there's D A E J I. Which which one is a more modern? The first one is more D -W -A -E. like a South Korean system. Okay. And North Korean, South Korean system. There are certain differences, but you can actually you know by looking at it see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the. Uh, South Korean, North Korean is not the alphabet per se, but because of dialects. Mm. The Pyongyang has uh, retained certain consonants that South Korean disappeared. So E will, originally the family name E was Li. It came from the Chinese character mm -hmm. plum tree. Mm -hmm. and, and gradually in the 18th century, Li disappeared, L disappeared. But in North Korea still, Li. So there's a movie called the Kancho uh, of Jin. So you know immediately if it's uh, written in uh, North Korea by looking at some of those things. So the Korean spoken in North Korea is probably much more traditional, correct? Because it hasn't been globalized. Like yeah. I mean, traditional, I don't know whether it's traditional, but mm -hmm. they call it or cultured, cultured language. South Koreans call it uh, standard language, you know? mm -hmm. and both have similar aims. When the liberation came, we wanted to get rid of Japanese expressions. Mm. So I remember as a young child that my mother said, oh, here's your pento. And then I got so mad. I said, mom, you should never use a Japanese word. For her, it was kind of natural. So I said, no, no, no. So I was a little patriot and says, uh, so actually they uh, invented a new word like toshira. So yes, was, yes. Yeah, lunchbox. So, Which also sounds very da Japanese, to be honest. No, it has nothing to do with Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something we wanted to ask you as well. I think a lot of Koreans like me who have Korean speakers' parents at home, mm. um, we grew up using just the words we learned from them and yeah. never having attended Korean mm -hmm, school. Mm -hmm. And then in my like 30s and 40s, I was so shocked to hear that I was using Japanese words. <laughs> Like uh, Takwan. <laughs> and uh, Tamanegi. Tamanegi, right. Sumekiri. Uh, 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 depends on, I mean, where are your parents from? People from southern parts, like Busan, and then also the, the southwestern mm -hmm. part, they got more influenced by Japanese, so they tend to use more. So in my family, in, in the central region, yes, my mother used pento, but mostly the not too many Japanese were used. But when I go to a friend's house, I was so amazed the amount of Japanese mm -hmm. words that they were using. But My mom you, said the running shirt, na, naningush. Naningu, yeah. Yeah, that is a word you would use if you're from the South? It is uh, actually the Japanese word like adopted from English, like a running, right? Mm. So uh, I kind of, uh, I think it was one time everybody's thing. So if you have an, that kind of underwear, that's a naningu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the young people, I don't think will use that. Right. No, but no, do you definitely. know why... Mm. Not all the, um, you would think after the occupation mm. that people were so 
eager to purge all the Japanese language.、Mm. And I know it's hard when you're used to a certain thing、mm. to get rid of it,、mm. but、um, why is it that some of these words persisted? Actually, it persists more in the American setting, in the immigrant setting, than in Korea.、Oh, I don't hear、They're、Nabanegi anymore in Korea. And then my students come with those words, and then I laugh because I know where it came from.、Mm-hmm. So they said, Oh, I say takwang. And says, they say takwang. And I says, Oh, no, you shouldn't say takwang. You should say tanmuji. Okay, I'd never even heard of tanmuji. We always use takwang still. <laughs> But you know, you shouldn't blame yourself. That's part of the kind of thing. And then many people don't know that it's even Japanese. Sort of the attempt to purge was more like top down.、Mm-hmm. But you know, certain expressions, I had to study like 405 different、uh, kind of Japanese influenced expressions. So words like shingyang or suda, you pay attention to something. They said, oh, this was、uh, brought up by Japanese, so we shouldn't be using that. But I said, no, I'm so used to that, I have to use that. Wait, why, why does it have roots in Japanese? Because before that, we didn't have that expression. We, we may have expression like eru suda, but shingyang wo suda was not part of Korean expression. There are so many of them because Japanese came with modernization.、Mm-hmm. So, telephone,、mm-hmm. movie, democracy.、Railroads. If you get rid of all、yeah. those, these are all Japanese made up. Uh, I see. Words, so at some point you really have to compromise, because it is a part of the culture and history. Like it or not, I yeah, think so.、Yeah. I think so because you know we had a, a Mongolian、uh, occupation of a hundred fifty years, a long time compared to thirty five、mm-hmm. years of、mm-hmm. Japanese,、mm-hmm. right? And we have some remnants still, but. You know, now people don't have this anti-Mongolian feelings. It's so much part of the thing. So things like Changagada, Changin,、uh, those are all Purame, like the hawk. These are all Mongolian words imported during the Korea Dynasty. But nowadays, who cares? Who, who mm-hmm. knows? Mm-hmm. So it is it has become part of that. So I think gradually all this will be、uh, part、mm-hmm. of Korean. And some will be purged. Some because when you're conscious, you don't use mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm. But not so much language. But I am disturbed personally by the amount of influence, Japanese influence on street food. So if I go to Korea, not so much when I was young, but these days, street food, casual food, I would say about eighty percent are Japanese influence. Oh,、It、really? It has a Korean fusional aspect,、mm-hmm. but. Uh, something like odeng or the、mm-hmm. yes. yeah yes. you shouldn't、mm-hmm. say odeng did you know that you have to say omuk <laughs> oh I did not know that <laughs> <laughs> and it's ubiquitous now、mm-hmm. people think、yeah. it's Korean yeah and、uh, you know what all this I mean you name it except for takoki none of these are originally Joseon Dynasty Korean even like how about sunde sunde I think that's、uh, that's Korean yes、okay. mm. what about honorifics. Yes. So we mentioned that in Korean, honorifics are very important.、Mm. When you learn to speak, you speak differently to an adult, to your peer. Yes. Not only the context, but even the vocabulary you might use. Is、yes. that right?、Mm. But I'm curious to know, the same way that in in the states, we've had、um, so、a little bit of a loose, <laughs> right? We've had a loosening of that type of speech. You know. Where sometimes a kid might call their dad "bro," you know. I mean,、uh, that might be extreme, but no. Is there a loosening of that? Does that right? Is there <laughs> been that type of loosening in Korea? Where uh, loosening, uh, yes, are- but then it's not gonna go away at all.、Uh, honorifics is so much part of the Korean、uh, system, so not so much paying deference or you know honorific, but because it's so much part of the、uh, grammar. So I told you that we don't say subject、mm-hmm. and object、mm-hmm. because the seo is there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it is ingrained in verbs. So it's not like you know we'll stop we'll stop saying sir or ma'am anymore. It's it's much more、uh, complicated, and that's a characteristic of Japanese and Korean. I have never seen any language which has a deeper, like a more complex honorifics embedded in the language.、Mm-hmm. So you cannot speak a single word without worrying about. What kind of ending am I going to use, or how am I calling this person? So it's a very difficult area, but the, not so much loosening. But young people. 
find it difficult to navigate. So what they do is in service uh, 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 sector, they always put 십니다, 세, 세요. So 커피 나오셨습니다. In Starbucks in Korea, they said 커피 나오셨습니다. So coffee came out honorifically. So that's really ungrammatical, but everybody's using it now because the honorific was only uh, restricted by the subject. If you're going, I am talking to you, then I'm going to, but coffee is the subject in the case, but still this coffee is intended for you, the mm -hmm. customer. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. everything is going to be uh, uh, sale. So uh, 10 years ago, I was complaining. Now I don't complain because I know that in 50 <laughs> years time, mm -hmm. everybody will be speaking that way because it will be easier. So massively apply on our effects. That will be easier. On the other hand, in the family members and friends, that has been loosened quite a bit. So in my time, I used non-honorific language to my mother. So I said, oh my God, Hessa? Which, and then people may uh, mm. look, uh, look a frown upon mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. your mom or your, especially your grandmother. How can you say that panmai, uh, impolite language? But, you know, these things are not polite and non-polite. Actually, it's a negotiation between deference and solidarity. So you want to uh, uh, express familiarity. That's why among family members, you want to sort of get rid of that. And I've seen these days, a lot of young people using uh, panmal to, the fa to their fathers. And in my time, I couldn't do that. Still with my father, mm -hmm. I would use 하셨어요, yo. But with my mother, it was easier to, use, to drop yo. So it's changing. So it's not uh, looked down upon that much. So, and also people have their make own their choices in certain ways, and especially in terms of address, how do I call you, right? And uh, I got disturbed when I was young that people who went to the same college, but who I don't know, they come to me and suddenly start to call me Anni or Nuna. And then I get offended, you know, I don't want to be called by their family names, Calling like cl close friends by family name, pseudo family name is so common that if you don't mm -hmm. allow it, you put distance between the mm -hmm. two of you. So, you know, Opa now is translated as Opa in K drama. As boyfriend, which was shocker to me. <laughs> boyfriend or even husband. Um. So, about 20 years ago, I had an assistant, a young person who just got married and moved here and who wanted to help with my class. So, I traveled with her to, to school for a semester. And halfway into semester, when she talks about Oppa, I didn't realize that she was talking about her husband. I was always thinking, why would she be so talking about her uh, Oppa, mm. in, uh, mm. her older brother in Korea? But it turns out that it was, now I know, and now I know. So uh, I get disturbed, but then that's the word. You know, as a linguist, we shouldn't be prescriptive. We cannot tell people, this is not how you do it, because it'll change. So I have a question. So yes. I have a husband who's not Korean, mm -hmm. white, and in talking, when he met my parents, he didn't know what to call them. Mm -hmm. How would a son-in-law address his parents? Good question. -in -law? Yes. Korea is in fluctuation. Mm -hmm. We have two sets of system. What women should call the in-laws versus what men should call the in-laws. And recently, it's a big issue because it's extremely sexist. So women are always called 도련님, like honorific forms, but uh, uh, guys always call like uh, 처제. Even though the older uh, siblings of your wife is still not properly that. And then nowadays, the people said, oh, use names like in English, if you're the same generation. Mm -hmm. And for it, for your case, you have to ask your parents. Well, I'm just curious what you would say, because so they told David, and they love him, uh -huh. they said, oh, call us Jang Mo Nim and Jang Im Nim. So uh -huh. that's what oh. he calls hit my parents. So that's your parents but, prefer. <laughs> but I get, and we didn't, I didn't know any better. He just, that's what he calls uh -huh. them. And then I think we had a family gathering with um, some other uh -huh. friends, and they heard him. Same just my parents uh -huh. And they laughed. They thought it was so funny. Is that a very proper kind of old-fashioned way? And they thought, and oh, good job. You tricked him into, <laughs> into like addressing you like, uh -huh. like a... That's a very proper, but probably because he's non-Korean, using yeah. that word might mm -hmm. have caused that uh, kind of response. But, you know, a little bit more familiar term will be 어머님, 아버님. Right. So, rather than 어머니, 아버지. So, 
Uh, do you call your uh, uh, mapa? No, I call it mom and dad, mommy, daddy. Ooh. Yeah. Oh my but gosh! For my, my children, I'm a I yeah. know said you can you can speak English, but you can never call me mommy or mom. You mm-hmm. should call me mama. Mm-hmm. So that I insist on that. Mm-hmm. Actually, I love it. I try to get my kids uh. who are not even 100% uh. to call me mama, and uh. they did a little bit, and I loved it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I reverted. So that's something that I cannot negotiate. Mm-hmm. But uh, if I were your parents, I would have my son-in-law call me uh, omoni. Mm, right. Money. And some more uh, progressive family, they call Amma too. Right. So he's very proper mm. in this sense. Yes. <laughs> I mean, in a way, just... being more proper is safer than being, mm-hmm. you know, you're mm-hmm. always more, you know, you are on the side of being overly polite. Right. So politeness can be a hurdle for communication because Absolutely. it's hard to, you don't know, especially my kids, when they meet like relatives, they don't, they're not very familiar. They, they kind of froze because they don't know how to address them, mm-hmm. how to talk. And then everybody kind of says, oh, they didn't learn Chondemal uh, uh, very well. So that's the first comment they hear from Korean relatives because this is that important. If somebody calls me, uh, say, without, you know, the proper ending, it's like, it's so shocking. It's yeah. different from other grammatical errors. Grammatical errors I can, you know, yeah. tolerate, but that's yeah. like almost insulting you. You like, yeah. oh. so I said, oh. and you know, uh, at the time when uh, anti-American feelings, especially toward uh, the military, was uh, big in Seoul, one of the kind of cause was that American GIs they learn Korean and in, in their base. And then come to you know city and the downtown and on the subway and they want to engage their uh, they want to use practice their Korean, but they do it with panmal. Yeah. Then yeah. that can be the sure uh, sort of start of any fight. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. never do that. So actually, by the uh, end of the second year, I don't teach panmal <laughs> because it's so dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So it's better, you know, even yeah. though it's awkward, it's always good to use yo. So going back to the word Han, um, there are some scholars who say that this is a Japanese um, invention used to keep the Koreans down in sorrow and despair. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it has a complicated history. Yes, the concept like Han existed even before Japanese colonial period. But during the Japanese colonial period, especially this uh, art historian looking at the Korean porcelain, uh, had, he had a beautiful writing about, oh, this race is really about the, the line, and the line is so sorrowful, and it embeds all the you know hardships that uh, Koreans have undergone. So yes, there is a theory that that I am aware of that. That, that and, was a Japanese art critic? Yes. And... That has been popular and been kind of accepted by Koreans, kind of without criticism. And then I think now we want to have a more balanced view. But my own view is that we cannot reject it completely. For one thing, we had Han uh, in the Joseon dynasty. If you look at all the stories, there is just a lot of Han, and especially Christian story. Mm-hmm. You know, if you die as a as a virgin, then you come back. And also stories are really about Han, Changwa Hong Yeonjeon. We have all kinds of things that we should interpret as Han, yes. But then kind of essentializing Han as the Korean characteristics is wrong. On the other hand, growing up after the liberation, if you look at the long history of Korea, there is Han, of course, but you know we had also a long period of prosperity and that has been all dismissed. And then as much uh, as Han, Hung is another concept that Korean is very uh, oh, familiar what is with. This? Hung is like oh, being very, oh, I don't know how to translate it. So if you look at BTS jumping around, that's Hung. So if you look at the Korea dynasty, uh, Koguryo dynasty, all mm-hmm. this kingdom, uh, there they have the, the 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 engraving on the the tombs, and they are like dancing like these K-pop stars. Exactly. So there, you know, Koreans in the Japanese history are known as people who love to sing and dance. So if it's all about Han, of course we would not be the number one Norebang people in the world. Okay, we need to popularize Hung now. <laughs> we yes. need to. And no, uh, so a counterbalance. when I went to actually Korea as a sabbatical, though, uh, one thing that I wanted to was, was learn uh, Pansori. Mm. Pansori was an old Korean opera, right? 
And I always thought of Kapansuri as something very sad yes. and full of Han. Mm -hmm. When I actually learned that, no, there's so much humor, so much, you know, things going on. And in the end, everything is a happy ending. So it's not really about Han. There's a Han element there. You have to suffer a lot to be able to deserve some goodness in the end. But, you know, it's, and there's, especially at Hongboga, there's so much kind of comical element there. So you can laugh for four hours, for instance. When I was a kid, I remember thinking how harsh it was when my mother would say to me in English, mm -hmm. you might as well go kill yourself. Mm -hmm. She would say that because she was translating the Korean expression. Uh -huh. which Naga Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we talked about it recently mm -hmm. and she la we laughed about it mm -hmm. because she understands how in translation, especially to a kid mm. like me, you know, growing up very Americanized. What kind of mother says that to your kid? But in Korea, that's a common expression. Yeah. So, right. uh, and I, I just yeah. wanted to add that one of our guests that we had previously on K-Pod, Daniel K. Isaac, mm. has a whole web series. About his mother, right? Yes. Right. It's called According <laughs> to yes. My Mother. These mean things that mm -hmm. his mom has said. Mm. Um, he's gay, just the things that, you know, it's mm. a good thing that your grandma's not alive uh -huh, um, uh -huh. to witness this. And uh, I had read some of his uh, translations mm -hmm. of what his mother mm -hmm. said, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so harsh. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a little taken aback at mm. just how mean she could be. Mm. And then I, I think the second time I went to look at it, I thought, oh, if you translate it into Korean, my mom says this stuff to me all the time. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, 죽다, 죽고 싶어, 뭐, 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 나가서 죽어라. Like, 죽고 싶어. Yeah, so <laughs> common. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's almost devoid of, you know, death there. Mm -hmm. So that's one common expression. And the Korean mothers being mean. Okay, what should I say about that? I think your parents have probably experienced the Korean War. Yeah. And probably, you know, getting education was hard. Mm -hmm. Korean uh, family dynamic is that you can, I'm sure there are also bad parents, but most kind of regular pa uh, parents would, could say mean things, but then kids don't necessarily act up. They think, okay, <laughs> maybe this is the way it is. And then my son, he was very critical in high school. And I now understand, you know, being an Asian boy here, uh, probably, you know, two other Asian boys in Princeton High School was kind of hard for him. So when he left, he said, Mom, you are always into, you know, uh, grades and stuff. And I, I want to give you an A, but I think as a mother, I think you are B minus. <laughs> And he said, probably that's the, the worst, worst grade you got in your entire life. <laughs> so I said, that's all right. I didn't fail at least. <laughs> and then the end of the freshman, he came home and says, mom, I was so cruel to you. You're very understanding. And you gave me freedom, not like other mothers. He, he went to a school in LA area and said, there are so many tiger moms. And then they said, you have to go to law school. You have to go to the... And you, you didn't say anything. And then one day he said, Mom, do I have to date only Korean girls? That was the question. And I said, this is the 21st century. I mean, this is America. Who said you have to only date Korean girls? And do, I mean, do whatever. And so by the end, uh, by the time he graduated, he says, Mom, I'm going to give you an A. <laughs> so it's a happy ending. So anybody who has difficulty with high schoolers, because I had difficulty. Another word that he says a lot is, you are so rude. And I said, in Korean, I cannot be rude to my children. That's not possible. <laughs> rude is only like uh, you when you talk to the higher people. <laughs> Doesn't exist in Korean. <laughs> Thank you so much, Young Lee, for having us to your home and for answering our hundreds of questions about language, culture, and rude Family. mom. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone would like to learn more about Professor Youngmi Yu Cho or learn more about her, the books that she's uh, co-authored, Integrated Korean, you can find her, you can Google her and find her on the Rutgers uh, website. 감사합니다. I'm doing this for my son and his uh, children, 여름, 올별, and 봄날. Thank you. Thanks again to Professor Youngmi Yu Cho. And if you have a question about traditional Korean medicine, the topic of our next episode, 
We'd love to feature it and hopefully have our hanbang expert answer it. You can email your questions to kpod at koreanamericanstory.org or DM us on Instagram at koreanamericanstory. Even better, email us a voice note with your name and your question. We look forward to hearing from you.